What's up, you guys? We are on week three of our Bible study, and I was just talking to uh, somebody just a minute ago about the purpose of continuing it, and I was saying that um, it's my hope that by me showing you guys these stories, uh, I'm teaching it this way on purpose, very meticulous, because part of my goal is that you get a really good understanding of these stories so that you could turn around and teach, right? And that's what Wednesday nights is like part of our goal is to make it specifically about discipleship and training. So um, I'm hoping that I can make these stories real enough for you guys that you feel like you kind of walk this alongside the Israelites. You see what I'm saying? And so that's the whole purpose behind me trying to make some of these renders for you guys to get you just kind of like put you in their shoes for a minute and kind of feel what that feels like. You see what I'm saying? So my hope and my goal with, with a class like this is that you guys... Um, would see yourselves in some of these stories. And, and I was talking to him too going, there's been times in my life where I've walked through stuff and I'm like, you know what this looks a lot like is Joseph's story. You know what I'm saying? Or this looks a lot like Moses' story and how did God come through for him? You know, like um, it, help, it gives you uh, endurance, I think sometimes and strength to know that God um, can work all things out for good and that he's with you. And if you'll trust his plan sometimes, sometimes his timing is the best timing. Um, but I'm going to get started tonight. Um, pick us up. Again, I still have this. If you guys need it, come to me after class. I've been posting these online. So if you need any of the teachings, or you want to link them to somebody, they're up there. Um, back on our timeline here, we're, we're, we're here. Um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. And now we're here at Moses. And there's this gap in between. <clears throat> excuse me, where Joseph was, where he had a rise to power, right? This is why I threw the pyramid on there. And Egypt kind of regained all the authority and the power. And Pharaoh used that. Instead of saying it's submitted to the Lord, remember a new Pharaoh comes into power and he goes, I don't know the old, the God that Joseph knew. I know me and I'm a God. And he turned himself and the whole empire built around him and his pride. And I, I was saying this the other day, like, I know in the story it can seem like the Egyptians are the bad guys, but the truth is pride is actually the bad guy. The actual villain in the story is what we let ourselves take on sometimes if we're not careful, and that's we become self-made and we start building statues to ourselves. And I know that sounds wild, like I would never do that. If you were put in the exact same situation as the Egyptians, would you be able to tell the difference? Would you be able to know? If an Israelite guy came through and started saying that this is the Lord, would you be able to see it? Anyway, it's a good lesson on like us not judging some of these people and instead going, I need to make sure I take an inventory in my own life to not become what Pharaoh became. Because I too am human, just like him, and I could fall victim to the same trap of pride and building everything around me. And then my pride gets so big that I drag all these people through these plagues and I make them suffer at the hands of these plagues just so that I don't have to lose and I can save face. You see what I'm saying? So 10 plagues sent. Uh, we're talking about Moses here. So this was, again, my, uh, my interpretation of Moses. Moses, to me, would have been an amalgamation of lots of races. I think anyone living at Ramesses at that time would have been an amalgamation of, they could have been Macedonian Greek, they could have been Middle Eastern, they could have been African, they could have been a little bit of everything. And they had living in that land for about 400 years at that time. So, 10 plagues sin against Pharaoh and the Egyptian gods. I didn't know if I mentioned this last week, but Pharaoh to the Egyptians was also a god. He himself was considered a god. They considered him godlike. So, by Pharaoh admitting that the, he wasn't the Almighty, that Yahweh was, was like admitting defeat to some extent. So his pride wouldn't allow him to do that. Oh, so even though God knew Pharaoh would not choose to relent, God still offered him the chance many times. Pharaoh's evil reaches a point of no return. Even his own advisors think that he's lost his mind. God takes over and bends Pharaoh's will. God takes over and bends Pharaoh's evil towards his own redemptive purpose. So God takes everything and turns it for good. God lures Pharaoh in his own destruction as he saves his people. So we left off here. The final night of the plague, this is the 10th one. It's the death of the firstborn. Without a doubt, the most severe of all of them. And God says, uh, this Pharaoh is very stubborn. It's going to be with force that he lets you go. It's going to be with force. So 
It's, he left it off with, there will be a great cry in Egypt that has never been heard before and never will be heard again. So God turns the tables on Pharaoh. Just as he killed the sons of the Israelites, so God will kill the firstborn of Egypt with the final plague. I remember his dad, which I guess in historically accurate terms, it would have been his grandfather. His grandfather had all the firstborn of the Israelites killed, remember, because they grow too numerous. So he had them all thrown in the Nile River. Okay, so this is where we're picking up at. This is the last one. And this is, uh, something's instituted here, and this is why I broke it up this week. I'm hoping, last week was kind of like uh, the grim side of the story. I'm hoping this side of the story is a little bit more on the positive side. I get to tell you guys the good part of God bringing them out of Egypt and delivering them. But God starts off by giving them um, some instructions, okay? So it's, uh, unlike Pharaoh, God provides a means of escape through the blood of the lamb. It's an important sentence. So God comes to Moses and Aaron and he tells them, <clears throat> sorry, I'm in, Egypt, I'm, in a, I'm in Exodus 12 now. So if you're following along, this is Exodus 12. He comes to Moses and Aaron and he tells them, this month will be the first month of the year for you. On the 10th, every man take a, first, uh, take a firstborn sheep or goat of his household according to the family size. I'm paraphrasing here, okay? It's a lot of instructions. But what he's doing is he's giving them instructions for the Passover. And he's saying, um, if the if the animal's too big, the family next door can share. But you keep it till day 14. At twilight, all of Israel will kill the lamb at the same time, then put its blood over the doorpost and on the lintel, the top of the door. So this is kind of like a, a visual of what that looks like. And I'm going to talk about this for a second because this whole chapter is about this. It says, um, they'll eat it roasted in fire with unleavened bread and bitter, bitter herbs, not baked or raw, but roasted in fire. This is very specific. Eat it all, the head and the entrails. It's disgusting. If anything is left the next day, burn it in a fire. And then he says, oh man, that's me, sorry. He says, eat it with haste, with a belt on your waist, sandals on your feet, and a staff in your hand ready to move. So he's saying, do this meal with these specific instructions. This is going to be called the Passover meal, but I want you to do it with all your gear on because at any second you might sprint out the front door. He says, eat it in haste. This is the Lord's Passover. So seven days you'll eat unleavened bread. And in Exodus 12, 12, God says, for I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and I will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. Remember we talked about that last week. I know it's kind of a rabbit hole, but there were demonic gods over principalities of darkness over Egypt and over its rulers. And part of what the Lord was doing is he was coming and demonstrating on the well-known lords, I mean gods of that time of the Egyptians. So all those plagues were in a direct contrast to some of those Egyptian gods. So I mean, even that one with the frogs doesn't make a lot of sense unless you know the lore. And the lore is that the Egyptians had an actual frog god, okay? So him plaguing with that is almost using what they already know well. The Egyptians knew these gods very well. So for him to come in and, and almost counter them like that escalated how quickly this could happen. So uh, both man and beast and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood will be a sign for you in the houses where you are. And when I see, sorry, when I see blood, I will pass over you and the plague will not be or destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So he's saying, mark your doors and when the spirit passes by and it, well, what did that look like i don't know it might have been a floating cloud angel i don't know what it was it just says uh almost like god's going to send an angel to do this so okay so he tells him that mark your doors it'll pass over your house you'll be spared so this day will be like a memorial to you and you will keep it as a feast to the lord throughout your generations and this is in the jewish culture this is called the feast of unleavened bread so the first day is you remove leaven from your house and have a holy convocation, basically like a party. You do seven days. You don't eat any unleavened bread. No work, only eating. On the seventh day, you have a holy convocation. Anyone who eats leaven during this window is cut off from Israel. These are very specific instructions. Until the 21st day of the month at evening, until then, only eat unleavened bread. Now, I brought this in because the Jewish people do this to this day. So, and the Jewish faith is not quite the same thing as Christianity. And I know if you're like new to the Christian faith, you think they're the same. They're actually not. In the Jewish faith, they don't believe in the, the New Testament Messiah. They don't believe that Jesus is Messiah, basically. They feel like it goes God and then Moses. Moses is the closest thing to God in their religion. So 
they still do the Passover feast every single year, just like this Exodus tells them to verbatim. And they're very specific about it. So uh, Judaism is based on Old Testament. To them, there is no Messiah. To us, though, let me talk about us for a minute. The Christians of the New Testament, teachings of Jesus, Jesus was the final sacrifice. He was our Passover lamb, his blood around our door. Okay, so what we believe is, it's not that it's bad to partake in this. If you guys want to try this, try it. But it's no longer something that we're like bound to under a covenant law because Jesus came and fulfilled that. Okay, so let me read that in Matthew 5, 17. It says that Christ fulfills the law. Do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So Jesus is going like, that, those laws and commandments that he gave were legit. I'm not here to say they don't matter. I'm here to say my blood fulfills them from this day forward. And so if you believe in me, I have fulfilled the law on your, ha- on your behalf. And part of him going through this with Israel is to realize that we can't fulfill it. We need a savior. Remember when I told you guys, all these stories lead to Jesus. This is part of Jesus' story right here. This is showing our need for a savior. So Apostle Paul writes in Romans, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And Colossians, uh, he says, uh, so let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or new moon or Sabbaths, which are shadows of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So that's the difference between us and uh, the Jewish faith. Um, Communion is our way of remembering the final sacrifice that Jesus made. So we do something similar, it's just a little different. So whenever Jesus came into town, he came during Passover when the Jews were celebrating this feast. And that's when he was taken off, crucified on the cross, and he ate and told them, take communion in remembrance of me, and don't forget the final lamb blood that was shed for eternity, right? Forever. If you believe in him, you got the blood over your door. That's what the gist of it is. So he took bread and he gave thanks and broke it and gave it to this, said, this is my body, which I is given to you. Do in remembrance of me. So moral of the story, the Passover is good. What matters is our worship of Christ. In some ways, this will look different for each person, whether we celebrate the Passover or not. It's helpful to learn from it and remember Christ's sacrifice is our Passover lamb. So that's the gist on that. So that's Passover. It's very specific. And the, like I said, the people in the Jewish faith do this very, very religiously, very consistently. Okay, so now to the story here. Death of the firstborn. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and says, pick out and take lambs for yourselves according to your families and kill the Passover lamb. And you will take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in blood. Hyssop is like a bunch of flowers. So you take these flowers, wipe it over your doors, uh, Strike the lintel and the two doorposts, and none of you shall go out the door of his house until morning, for the Lord will pass through and strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. That's wild that he would name his angel the destroyer. Anyway, I'll talk about it. If I can get to the end, I'll talk about some of that. Uh, teach this Passover to your sons and continue to partake in it. And when they ask you why, you do this service, tell them it is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our household. So when they take this feast, that's what they talk about. They sit around and they read about the Exodus and when their people were delivered out of the hands of oppression and slavery and they eat in remembrance of that. So, okay, so that night... And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt for there was not a house where there was not one dead. So this is a very dark moment in history here. So firstborns die, uh, Pharaoh gets the word out and he calls for Moses and Aaron and he says, rise, go out from among my people, both you and the children of Israel and go serve the Lord as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds as you have said and be gone and bless me also. I thought it was interesting that he ended with that. Like, please remove this curse from me. I don't want to be cursed anymore. So could you guys bless me before you leave when you take all your stuff? 
So this is a this is a moment where the story kind of swings in a positive direction. They have been officially let go. The Egyptians actually come out to them and say, um, "You guys need to leave, or we're all going to be dead." So I can imagine the Egyptians feeling incredibly traumatized by this, even their firstborns dying to save Pharaoh's ego. You see what I'm saying? And so they're kind of warding them off. It says that the, the Hebrews had bowls of bread attached to their clothes, so they left with their bread before it was even leavened. Remember earlier when it says, do it with haste, keep your staff in your hand and be ready to go, because at any second this could happen. So just like Moses told them, they asked the Egyptians for gold and silver, and they gave it to them because they had favor with the Egyptians. So therefore they plundered the Egyptians on the way out, and they were officially free. Now, Imagine for a second, let me just give you an, a comparison. I don't know if you guys, you guys ever watch uh, the ball drop on New Year's Eve? Okay, it looks kind of like that. Okay, they say in the bow tie, me and Steph have actually been to this. We've been here down in the little midst of these people. It was bananas. It was the most crazy thing maybe ever with the, the amount of just herds and herds of people. And you think if somebody starts moving, which for your direction, we're all just going to dog pile and get stampeded out. Anyway, They say in the camera shot, whenever you're looking at, there's two roads that cross like this or Times Square is called the bow tie. They say in the bow tie, there's roughly 900,000 people. So as much as you can probably see on cameras, about 900,000. But there's probably, with all the side streets and all that, there's about 2 million people here. So just to put it in perspective, they walked out with a million and a half people out of Egypt. So massive, massive caravan of people leaving Egypt. Um, So the Egyptian... Then the children of Israel journeyed uh, to Ramesses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. A mixed multitude went up with them also, flocks and herds, a great deal of livestock. So about a million and a half people, that's, that's wild. They had been slaves at this point for over 400 years. So lots of people making their way through the desert, massive caravan of people marching, Now, this next part is a map, and I know it's kind of hard to see, and I've done a ton of research on this, so I just, at some point, there's all these different theories. You've got to just pick one and commit to it and just go like, all right, this is the one I'm going with. I'm going with option C. It's like A, B, C, D. Where did they go? And this is, remember earlier I was telling you guys, there's all these different cities that don't really exist anymore, so they kind of go like, well, when they say the city of Succoth, it's here, and then another person's like, no, 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 it's way over here, you know, anyway. So, it could have been either one of those two, um, and then... Uh, let's see, they take Passover there. Uh, no one uncircumcised is allowed to partake. This is another strict law. If you weren't circumcised, you weren't considered part of the squad. And I know that sounds really gross, but if you think about back then in Sandals times, it was like an easy way to prove you were in the gang. Does that make sense? Without getting too graphic, it was like, oh, if you're a Hebrew, like, okay, show me. You know what I'm saying? And like, there was no denying it. There was no lying about it. It was, it, you either were or you weren't. So, that was a, an important part of their custom. Um, they take Passover that day. Uh, Moses reviews the laws of the Passover. He speaks to Israel, and he beckons them to remember this day, the Passover, the first day of the year to them, and the day they went out of Egypt. And it's called Abib. It's the first month of the Jewish calendar. Anyway, then Moses reviews the law of the firstborn. He tells them to give the firstborn of every animal and man to the Lord from here on out. And he says, if it's a donkey or a human, then it can be substituted by a lamb. So they established this like firstborn consecration to the Lord by a lamb substitute. And that's how they did it. It was, and they did it for many, many years, but this is the beginning of that. Uh, Another cool thing is whenever they left Egypt, uh, hold on, I'm I'm ahead. Then uh, do this, Do this to remember that because Pharaoh was stubborn, the Lord took the firstborn of both man and beast in Egypt, set them free. So now they're going out into the wilderness past this point. And it says, um, instead of going the short way, which would have been like this, because this right here is the promised land. Okay, so whenever you guys hear the promised land, the land of Canaan, it wasn't established yet. We know it today as Israel, right? It wasn't Israel yet. It wasn't anything yet. It was just a big, huge land, and Shechem was the only like known city at that time. Jerusalem was there at that time also, but this whole land here was the land of Canaan, okay? So it makes sense that they would just peel out of Ramesses, right, and just follow the coastline. The problem was that this city right here was the capital of the Philistines. And so it actually says that God intentionally sent them this direction because he knew if they came up the coastline like this, the Philistines would kill all of them. 
it actually says the Philistines would confront them in battle and the Israelites would see war and turn around and go back to Egypt because they would be scared of the war. So God intentionally leads them into the wilderness. Uh, so last week I ended with, no, not last week, the week before last, I ended with Joseph's dying statement. I don't know if you guys remember this, but he says, uh, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That was like Joseph's dying wish. Well, in order to honor this, Moses, it actually says he goes back and gets Joseph bones so that he can bury him with his fathers. And so this is verse 19. It says, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had placed the children of Israel under a solemn oath saying, God will surely visit you and you will carry up my bones from here with you. So that's pretty cool. Pit stop to get Joseph's bones. They took their journey from Sukkoth and encamped in Etham. So this is the next map that is uh, very debatable here. Which one direction do they go? Here, here. And there's a really good case for both. I don't know. I'm going with this top one that's green, just so you guys know. Okay. Even though I kind of like this theory a little better because it feeds my conspiracy theory side that makes more sense, I actually think after doing the research, it was this, meth this map. Now, just to give you guys context, this dark area right here is like big mountains, okay? And then when it gets a little lighter, they're mountains-ish kind of hills. And then this out here is just straight up sand, okay? If that gives you any kind of context. So this is big mountains here. So here's Etham. Uh, and the Lord went before them and a pillar of cloud in the day and a column of fire at night. And it led the way um, every they, everywhere they were going, they would just follow the Lord basically. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of cloud by night for the people. So they always had, all they had to do is wake up and, and follow the Lord. That's it, real simple. Just follow the Lord. And you could do a whole sermon on that right there. Uh, so next part of the story. Um, you guys are familiar with this part, but they are going to cross the Red Sea. So let me get into some possibilities here. The first possibility is right down here at the bottom is this thing called the Straits of Tyran. And it's a, it's a relatively shallow area. Um, this is the Red Sea, and these are the two. This is the, uh, where the strait is. Uh, I'm coming up short. Anyway, these gulfs are where they, where they cross. So they either cross down here at the Strait of Tyran, which is roughly 11 miles shore to shore, or they would cross at this next one, which is this Nueva Beach. And it's up here a little bit higher in the B Gulf of Aqaba. So they would have had to go across. Now remember, I don't know if you guys remember this, but Moses spent years in Midian with Jethro, remember? His father-in-law. He spent roughly 40 years over there being a shepherd before God came to see him in the burning bush. So Moses is familiar with this territory. So you can imagine as he's leading them through some of this wilderness that he's familiar with some of these spots, okay? So this is the one I'm going with. Okay, I'm going with this Nueva Beach, and if you look, there's kind of like this mountain range. I know it's hard to see from far away, but it's very narrow, and then it dumps out onto this big, huge beach right here. And the cool part about this, it's again, it's a little bit hard to see, but this gulf is super deep. I mean, like 8,000 feet deep, which is, it's hard to describe, but it's taller than the Burj Khalifa. You guys know that in uh, the tallest building in the world that's in Dubai? Okay taller than that. So you can imagine trying to walk a caravan of a million and a half people down a slope that high, it would be tough. But right here where this beach is, and I know it's kind of hard to see, but the earth kind of tapers out into the ocean some. So it's not as deep right there. It's not exactly shallow. It's still about 800, 800-ish 800 feet deep, but it's shallower. Anyway, from the side, it kind of looks like that on Google Earth. If you go look at this, this is the Nueva Beach on the coast of the Sinai Peninsula. It's got a mountain range coming through like this. This is where many people, me included, believe that the Israelites dogpiled out on this beach, a million and a half of them, and were waiting for instruction. So God tells them, turn and camp before Phi uh, Heroth between Migdal and the sea. Migdal is like an Egyptian watchtower. So this is a whole other theory of all these different Migdals that would be along the Sinai Peninsula. And that's how Pharaoh knew where they were at because they would... You guys have seen Lord of the Rings, right? They like light the fires and then all the fires light all the way back to town. It's kind of like that. So if this Migdal would have been arguably up on this hill, would have seen them marching through there. They would have lit lights all the way back to Egypt to let Pharaoh know where they're at. So anyway, that's one theory. So opposite of Belzephon, you will camp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel that they were bewildered by the land. The land has closed them in. 
Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and all his army that the Egyptians may know I'm the Lord. So here they are camped by the sea, seemingly cornered with no way out, right? That's a lot of people posted up on this beach. This is what the beach looks like right now. You can go stay in a resort down there today. People riding camels and swimming. Okay, so that's Nueva Beach. They're cornered here. Uh, Pharaoh gets word of this back in town. And it says, Now it was told to the king of Egypt that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this? Why have we let Israel go out from serving us? So Pharaoh rounds up the boys. Uh, it says he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Also, he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with captains over every one of them. So he took the A team. He took everybody. I want all my best generals, all my best chariots. We're going to get our workers back. We don't feel like building all this stuff. It's way too much work. We got to get them back. So it says, and the Lord hardened the heart of the Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel. So there's a good amount of time that goes by. I guess they're, they're posted up on the beach out here. Uh, Pharaoh makes his way maybe on the same path as them, comes up this narrow pathway and corners them. So it says, when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, because there was no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the world, the word that we told you in Egypt? saying, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die out here in the wilderness like a bunch of punks. So they're complaining. They're going like, it was better back in Egypt, even though I was a slave and they whipped me all the time. At least I had a warm bed and some food. We don't know what you just did to us. So I'm trying to put this into perspective because I want you guys to take the position of Moses for a minute. Going like, what would you do in a moment like this? Having all these people turn on you roughly a million and a half of them. Um, so Moses very likely turns to God and, uh, well, he, Moses says to the people, do not be afraid, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. And I meant to go back to my Moses slide here. Uh, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you seem today, you will see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. That's quite the statement to say back to them. You talk about max level confidence in the Lord, Moses would have to have at this point without the water doing anything behind him. It's still there, right? So his confidence in God has got to be sky high, very high, that he would speak this way and go, not only is God going to deliver you, but you see that army coming in full speed, you're not going to see him any day after today. They're all going to be gone. Now, max level confidence, right? He spins, and he, it says, the Lord said to Moses, uh, there, ha there had to be a window right here where Moses turns around and goes, all right, God, I just talked a lot of trash for you. You've got to come through here, or I'm going to look really bad. Like, you've got to deliver us. We're all going to die today. And God says to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward, but lift up your rod, stretch out your hand over the sea, and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry land through the midst of the sea. And indeed, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they will follow them in. So I will gain honor for Pharaoh and his army and his chariots, his horsemen. Then the Egyptians will know I'm the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. So Moses steps out here. And while he's doing that, it says that Pharaoh came close and it says the spirit, it says the angel of God who was going before them in the pillar goes around to the backside and blocks the entryway. So it's kind of like a holding pattern. And it says on one side, it was dark cloud. They couldn't see anything. On the other side, it was fire for the children of Israel so they could see. It provided light for them. So <clears throat> the next, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, uh, well, this is, he's a little bit more on the water here. Uh, and it says, And the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land. And the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground. And the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued them and went after them. 
in the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and horsemen. So, again, I got all these photos just to show you guys. This is a plethora of movies. There's a lot of, a lot of demonstrations of this, okay? This is the old school one from the 50s. This is Charlton Heston. This is uh, an AI rendering of the walls of water, roughly 800 feet high, which is crazy high, by the way. You know, there's all these theories, like it says God came at the east wind to move the water and it, and it drew the water back. They're like, oh, maybe it was like a tide going down and they walked across on dry land and then God raised the tide and went back. That's one of the theories. But like biblically, it says it, the water was like a wall to them on the left and the right. So it had to look something like this. It had to. So anyway, they cross. Um, Moses goes out, throws his hands up, uses the rod and parts the water and they all cross. Now this is a 10 mile hike across this thing. So it's just going to take them a minute. So they start off in the middle of the day. They're still going across by the time the sun sets. It's dark outside. And Pharaoh's guys, at some point, I guess God lifts the pillar, the pillar of fire and they begin to pursue the Egyptians. Okay, so, I mean, uh, the Israelites. So the Egyptians are pursuing them. They're coming into the water, but they'd still be a good distance off. I got a, I got a cool picture here of like, Maybe what it would have looked like standing down inside of those walls. If you imagine your kids and your wife and you're pulling them across, plus you got like carts and stuff of food and donkeys, they're probably tripping, you know, making all kinds of noise. So it would have been scary. But what ends up happening is they, Pharaoh's chariots follow them in and God tells, and this is where uh, it says, God, now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of the fire and the cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians. So it says God threw the pillar before he picks it up. It says he confuses them. And it says he took off some of their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. So even some of Pharaoh's dudes before they went into the sea was like, this is a bad idea. We're about to die. But Pharaoh's ego is sky high at this point. He's like, no, I'm going to hawk them down and kill every one of them. We're not bringing nobody back. We're going to kill them all. So God tells Moses now, he's on the other side, and he tells them to close the sea. And I, I don't have a rendering for that, so we'll use this one. But he goes back. It says, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So uh, I, I read the wrong one. Sorry. Now it came to pass in the morning. Watch. The Lord looked down. Uh, I'm bad at this. Okay, here we go. Moses closes the sea on Pharaoh. And the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand and the waters may come back on the Egyptians and on their chariots and their horsemen. So Moses did. He stretched out his hand over the sea. And when the morning appeared, the sea turned to, returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing at it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came. So you can imagine it's being held up. Boom, it all crashes in and kills them from the impact. It says, uh, this is kind of gross, but it says, no, not so much of them remained, but the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea and the waters were a wall to them on the right hand and the left. It says, so the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. So probably washed a lot of their bodies up on the seashore. Pretty gross. Um, Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. This doesn't last very long, but then they go into, okay, they're on the other side of the, the water now. <clears throat> they're on this side in the land of Midian. And uh, there's a little chapter here where Moses and the people of Israel sing a song about the Lord saving them, delivering them. The words are essentially, the Lord reigns as king. God is confronting evil in the world. He's redeeming those who are enslaved bringing his people into the promised land, his presence will dwell among them. Then Moses' sister Miriam takes out a timbrel, which is basically a tambourine, and some of the other timbrel players dance and join her in song. And this story summarizes what it looks like when God becomes king over Israel. So at this point, Israel was fully submitted to the Lord, going, yes, you are our God, you are our deliverer, you show up and we believe in you. But again, this fades quickly so where am i at on time okay i'm good so this next story here they make their way into mara okay so i don't know how long they camped here but the next part of the bible it picks up on them moving down this direction now do i know mara is exactly right there no i do not it could be somewhere in this vicinity but this is where we're going with okay so yes uh exodus 15 now is where i'm at the story takes a sharp turn it says they continue the journey three days into the wilderness of shur 
and found no water. They came to a lake that is bitter and named it Mara, which means bitter. So I don't know if some of you have heard this story, but Moses, um, they find a little small pond. It says the people complain and ask Moses, what are we supposed to drink? So Moses asked God what to do, and the Lord shows him a tree. Moses puts the tree in the water and turns the water from bitter to drinkable. Moses then commissions them that the Lord is good And they should follow his commands because the Lord is the one who heals them. So again, this is a constant struggle for Moses to constantly have to put the Lord back on the throne and go, it's been a whole five seconds. and You guys are already back to complaining and being worried and letting fear run your life. Trust in the Lord. He's going to come through. Okay. So he's pointing them back to God. Now they go a little further. Uh, They keep marching to this next city called Elam. And this one's pretty cool. This is part of why I think Mara was on the way because Elam is still there today. And I'll show you a picture in a minute. But it says they they come to Elam where there was 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. It actually says that by number in the Bible. So it's very specific. 70, somebody sat there and was like 70, right down 70. 70 trees and they camp by the waters. And this was kind of like a light at the end of the tunnel. They were very excited to be there. And you can go there today. This is called the 12 Springs of Moses. And um, 12 Springs of the Prophet Moses is a historical landmark located in the valley of Menka, uh, Saudi Arabia. The the, the, uh, sprouting of water and its flow against gravity in the middle of the desert appears nothing less than magical. So everybody around this area agrees. And they visit this like kind of like a national landmark. Pretty cool. So they got relief in Elam. Now, the next part, some of you guys have heard the story. They keep making their moves here, and they go into what's called the wilderness of sin. Nobody knows, again, exactly what that looked like. And there, there's a possibility they could have marched all the way this way, all the way back. I don't know, but I, I drew it roughly in this vicinity. But this is where they, they moved the camp, and they traveled through the wilderness of sin between Elam and Mount Sinai. And it says, Then all of the children of Israel complained. This is roughly 75 days after they left Egypt. So they're complaining again. Um, They don't have any food. And it says, oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full. So they're reminiscing. They're going, y'all remember back home in Egypt when we was eating like kings, bro? We thought we were slaves. We were eating real good. Now we're out here in the middle of nowhere starving. But remember back how good it was in Egypt. It was awesome. This sounds like us sometimes, straight up. And I, again, I, people do like sermons on this all the time. So it feels like I'm browsing over this stuff. Like all these little stories I'm telling, like people have done like full-blown sermons on some of these stories and how easy it is. It's the children of Israel are like a type and shadow of, of our modern day life and how we get sometimes, right? Where we fluctuate so easy. One minute we're like, we trust God. He's obviously the provider and he's coming through. Two seconds later, we're going, man, I had it so good. And it was so much easier then. Remember that? Like how fast we get in, uh, what is it called? The grass is always greener syndrome sometimes. You know, we forget how far God's brought us. Anyway, I'll I'll keep going here. So this is Exodus 16, 4. He says, then the Lord said to Moses, behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. So God's going like, I'm going to feed them, but I'm going to institute a system for this feeding because I want to see if they can follow my commands. But what, and I'll, I'll explain this in a second, but what God's trying to do is he's going like, I can get closer to y'all if the sin isn't there. And if you can get some of the sin out of the way, I can bring myself in proximity to you closer. And that's what his goal is. His goal is to do that. So then Moses and Aaron say, oh, he tells them, uh, go out and gather, and on this, uh, every day I'll have you go and gather. But on the sixth day, they're going to prepare enough on what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much. And they'll get, So what he's saying is six days a week there's going to be enough food. On the sixth day, I'm going to double the amount of food. I want you to gather twice as much so that on the seventh you can rest, that you don't have to gather anything. You would have gathered all of it the day before. So then Moses and Aaron said to the children of Israel, at evening you will know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning... You will see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your complaints against him. But what are we that you complain against us? This is Moses and Aaron going like, I don't know why y'all get so mad at us. Y'all mad at the Lord. Make no mistake, when you're complaining like this, 
I know y'all feel like y'all don't trust us. What y'all are really saying is you don't trust him. That's what you're really saying. He says, and what are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. So God tells them that night that they will eat meat in the morning and bread in the afternoon. So it says, quail came up in the evening and covered the camp. I kind of have a, somewhat of a render here of them just posted up in tents and gathering. Man, uh, it says, and in the morning a dew came and left behind a white round bread substance and they named it manna. It tasted like wafers made with honey. Moses instructs them on how to gather the manna. And so they have special instructions on like how to gather them. It's one omer per family, and then they can gather them all at one time. Anyway, there's, there's a lot of details. I'll spare you guys. But uh, Moses, <clears throat> there's even a point where Moses tells them how to gather it, and it says, don't leave any out overnight. It'll go bad, and they end up leaving it out overnight, and it goes bad, and it says Moses is angry. So I, I just put vexed here. Like He's like, oh, my God, these people are driving me nuts. I give them really simple instructions, and they don't do it. So Moses is kind of going back and forth with God, going, God, what, what do I do here? So he says, only gather six days. On the sixth, gather twice as much. Cook all your food so that you can rest on the seventh. Eat that today, for today is Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you'll gather it, but on the seventh of Sabbath there will be none. So a few people still went out and looked and gathered, even though they were said not to. So the Lord tells Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? So he's getting mad at Moses, going like, I put you over these people and they still break in the laws. Like, you got to make this right. And he says, see, for the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he gives you on the sixth day, two days worth of bread. Let every man remain in his place. Let no man go out. And the children of Israel um, ate manna for the next 40 years. This is how they ate. Very interesting part of the story. I always kind of thought it was like a one-time thing. Like, no, this is how God fed them in the wilderness for the next 40 years. He fed them this way. So manna in the morning, quail in the afternoon. So this is a great lesson on, again, you could do a whole sermon on this, but God giving you what you need, not necessarily what you want. And there's a lot of times in our life where I, I can tell you, at least from personal experience, like I'm glad he didn't give me what I asked for because what I asked for wasn't really what I needed. Instead, my prayers sound a little different now. They sound like, God, give me what I need in this situation, not necessarily what I want. In other words, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? the way Jesus tells us to pray, going like, I don't actually know this whole situation. What would be better is if I could trust the way you see it. So well, how about the way you see it comes to fruition? That would be better. Let me pray that. So next part of the story, they move a little farther and make their way, uh, went backwards. They make their way to a city called Rephidim. And this is a place that still exists. And they come to so as they move the camp out of the wilderness into Rephidim, again, they have no water and they complain to Moses, what shall we drink? And this is Exodus 17 now. He says, why is it that you have, again, this is their complaint. Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cries out to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They're almost ready to stone me. So he's like, I'm trying everything I can. They're getting upset. So some of the God tells him, take some of the elders and the rod you parted the sea with. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you will strike the rock, and water will come out of it that people may drink. So Moses goes up and whacks a rock with his staff, and water flows out and goes everywhere. Now here's the cool part. There's an actual rock in Rephidim that is massive, and it is split right down the middle. And if you go do like a bird's eye view of the area around this, all of this textile is different almost like it's been flooded before but you go a little far away from the rock and the and the, the sand goes back to being regular sand but all around this rock looks like it's been flooded with water and the, the sediment's different and i know you can't really tell but this rock is huge see those people massive anyway it's a national landmark part of the issue is it's in saudi arabia and they are very limited on who can visit and who can't and so it's real restricted so you can visit it's just a it's a big process Anyway, Moses does it in the sight of the elders and everyone. He names the place Meribah, or place of contention, because of the contention of the children of Israel, because they tempted the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? So it seems to me, by reading this, that God did them this favor, but he was not happy in the way that they're acting. He's not happy with the way that they're holding him in contempt and complaining that way. Anyway, another part of the story, and I think I have a, here 
Okay, so at some point, the Amalekites attack the children of Israel as they're making their way through the desert. And there's stories about this later. I've actually read, I've actually read stories about this all the way to the story of David. So David's many, many, many years later, right? King David comes in and God actually goes, you remember those Amalekites that attacked my people out in the open? David, I want you to take your swords and I want you to go kill all of them. I want you to erase them because of what they did to Moses. So this is that story. So Moses gets attacked and he asks, um, this is also where the character we're going to talk about next week comes into the scene, and that's Joshua. We're going to talk about Joshua next week, the conqueror for Israel. And Moses turns to Joshua, and he's like, Joshua, take the boys and go over there and fight King Amalek. So Joshua goes down and fights them, and the way it works is as long as Moses' arms are being held up, the Israelites are winning the battle. And so his arms start getting tired. So he has his brother Aaron and another guy named Ur hold his arms up. And as long as Moses' arms are up in the air, they win, they win the battle. The Israelites eventually overturn the Amalekites and they flee and they go back to doing what they were doing. So the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. That's the most gangster sentence the Lord's ever put on anybody. And he really doesn't like this guy. But if you do a little research in the Amalekites, I talked about them in my class. They were like a sort of a savage tribe people, face painters, pagans. They used to take the Israelites, and this is gross, sorry. They would take their foreskins and throw it at the sun and cut, curse the Lord is what it said. So they were very, very nasty and, and mean people. Anyway, so they attack them. They survive. They, the Israelites keep moving. Now, this next part of the story is pretty cool. Um, my favorite boy comes on the scene. This is, you guys remember who this is? Jethro. Okay, Moses' father-in-law is like, all right, I heard the boys are on my side of the town. I got to go pay him a visit. So it says he takes Zipporah and the kids, which Zipporah did travel with Moses to Egypt, but it never actually says when he sends her back. It just says that he does. So I would imagine that Whenever the plague started, he's probably like, it's about to get real dirty. You might want to take the kids and go back home to your dad. So at some point, he sends her home. Um, so Jethro, the high priest of Midian, heard, oh, uh, he got a different outfit now. He went home and got his 90s jacket windbreaker. And he brought a modern day tent just in case. That's what AI is like, okay? It just does weird stuff sometimes. But I like this rendering. So, Okay, Joseph, the, I mean, uh, Jethro, the high priest of Midian, heard all that Moses' God had done for him, Israel and its people. He loads up Zipporah and Moses' two sons and sends word that he's coming to visit Moses at the holy mountain of God. And I'm about to talk about that. But Moses greets him when he arrives. He bows and kisses him, and they go into Moses' tent and chat. Moses brings, up, brings him up to speed on everything. He talks about leaving Egypt. Pharaoh, all the hardships, and how the Lord delivered them. And Jethro celebrates with joy. He says, now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods. For in the very thing in which they behaved proudly, he was above them. In other words, like every single one of those Egyptian gods that thought they were awesome, God came and outdid them, right? That's what he's saying. So he says, then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and, off, and other sacrifices to offer to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. Now, this is the cool part. The next day, Moses sat to judge the people like he usually did each day. And in a line of people, he stood before them from morning till evening. So this is just like every day in the life of Moses. He'd wake up in the morning, eat breakfast, and then he'd go sit in his chair to judge one person after another with all their drama. Okay, and this is the best way I can describe it. It's like, they took my goat, and they weren't supposed to take my goat. I told them they couldn't have it till the end of the month. They took it two days early. Who's right? And he would go, you committed to that, so go back to your house. You're not supposed to give it to them till the 30th. They took it on the 28th. That's not fair. Give it back. Wait till they're Okay, so parenting, babysitting, that's what he was doing. So it says he would go out every day. So Jethro sees him doing this, and he tells him, what is this thing that you're doing for the people why do you alone sit and all the people stand before you from morning until evening? And Moses says, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a difficulty, they come to me and I judge between one and another. And I make known the statutes of God and his laws. So Moses' father-in-law says, the thing that you do is not good. This is not good. 
He says, both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out for this thing is too much for you. You are not able to perform it by yourself. Now he says, listen now to my voice and I will give you counsel and God will be with you. How many of you guys, if you were Moses, could let Jethro give you counsel? And if so, would you listen to him? After you just got through personally lifting the rod up and parting the Red Sea, now your father-in-law is going to come give you advice. Would you have the humility to allow him to speak into your life and take his counsel? Okay, so I know it sounds wild, but this is, shows you a little bit of Moses' personality that he was willing to let his father-in-law, who was but a simple sheep herder, right, and a priest, and Moses himself just got through part in the Red Sea. So he's, he's a celebrity at this point. Anyway, so he says, <clears throat> stand before God for the people so that you may bring the difficulties to God and you shall teach them the statutes and the laws and show them the way which they must walk and the work they must do. So he says he advises that he distribute the authority among trusted men of God that he can train up. He says, put some over tens, some over 50, some over 100, some over 1,000. Let them judge all day. If it's a big matter, they can bring it to you. If it's small, let them decide. So Moses heeded the voice of his father-in-law and did all he said. And that's the end of J Jethro's story. So he comes through. And gives Moses some pointers. He's like, listen, kid, you're going to burn yourself out if you try to play parent for every single one of these people. You need to learn how to let go of control a little bit and learn how to empower people. You have to extend your authority, train them up in the way, and then let them decide. Like he says, let them decide on some of those matters or you're going to burn yourself out. So now, next part of the story, and I'm actually going to end here. I got a few minutes. Um, they make their way. In the third month, they left Egypt. The children of Israel left Rephidim and went into the wilderness of Sinai and camped under the holy mountain of God. And this is another, I don't know if y'all know this, but th that area, like it, it'll straight up snow up there. So I know you always think in your head, like the Israelites are sweating every day because you think of Saudi Arabia as hot, but it actually gets crazy cold up there also. So there's a good chance that they're dealing with freezing conditions as well. But they make their way around the wilderness to Mount Sinai here, considered the holy mountain of God. And if you guys would like to know, this is it. This is the mountain. It's called Jabal Laws, and it's the Saudi Arabian mountain. And you ask them, they say, that is the mountain of Yahweh. That is what they will tell you if you go over there and you speak to those people, the local residents. They said, this is the mountain of Yahweh. And if you spin around the other side, this is from Google Earth, by the way, modern. Uh, it looks kind of like this, and this is interesting, but there's a possibility they dogpiled over here, and there's this weird, like, Pentagon flat area right here, and I know it's marked at the church, but there's nothing there. It's just a spot. So there's a possibility that he walked Mount Sinai, the mountain of Yahweh, and it might have looked a little bit like that, if that helps at all. Like, there's a possibility they were all here, and Moses and the boys went up to here and then made their way all the way up. I'm not sure, but I'll read you guys the next part. This is what that little Pentagon area looks like. If you were to actually stand up there right now, look out south in the direction, back towards Egypt. So here's kind of the view from the other side, maybe what it would look like. And then here, the holy mountain of the Lord. Well, let me, let me read this next part. One second. So Moses went up to God, and Lord, the Lord called him from the mountain, saying, Thus you will say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel, that you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. So an important sentence right there. God says he brought them on eagles' wings. In other words, he was protecting them the whole way. And he was saying, I brought you to myself. And I, I'll talk about this in a second. But <clears throat> thus, now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you will be a special treasure to me above all the people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which I speak to the children of Israel. So Moses goes up, God tells him all this. This is Moses goes down and calls for the elders and they agree to honor the Lord and keep his commandments. So Moses goes back up the mountain and tells the Lord they're in. They want to be in covenant with you and become your holy nation, your holy people, your holy priest. So Mo Moses says, behold, I come to you in a thick cloud that the people... So Moses goes back up, tells the Lord he agreed, and the Lord says, okay, cool. I'm going to come to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak to you and believe forever. So this is a historical moment. God himself is going to come down and dwell with the people for the first time ever. So Moses comes down and tells them to buckle up 
in three days, the Lord is coming. It says, for on the third day, the Lord is going to come down on this mountain in the sight of all the people. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, take heed to yourselves that you not go up on the mountain or even touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain will be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him. But he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow. Whether a man or beast, he will not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. So Moses went and washed and sanctified the people and told them, do not come near your wives. It's an interesting point, but I think he was trying to get them as less defiled as possible and as clean and as uh, in the right standing and pure as humanly possible before they went up to, to see the Lord. So this is the holy mountain renderings all throughout history. There's a lot of these, okay? There's this moment where God comes down in a cloud and I'll read this piece to you. It says, um, Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and the sound of a trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like a smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. So you can imagine this is a pretty scary, I and mean, it's a pretty decent rendering of them being worried. Now, I do have uh, another rending that like a French painter did. That's pretty cool. I mean, it's a little taken out of context. Um, here is what I feel like realistically it looked like. So thick cloud, God's now dwelling there. Trumpet sounds really loud, lightnings everywhere, and God is actually speaking, and they all tremble in fear. And Moses and the and the boys are over here to the side. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna I'm almost done, but I'm gonna end here. So now Mount Sinai, it says, uh, and when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. So you can imagine the voice of the Lord booming through this huge smoke, right? talking to Moses and God's going like, I'm doing this on purpose because I want them to hear my voice like this so that they, I will know that I am the Lord. It says, then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. And that's where I'm going to end this story. And I'm going to give you guys the summary real quick. And I was going to kind of base this off my timing, but so the Exodus was technically complete at this point. They made it to their place of worship. And what I mean by that is that was their original request when they wanted to leave Egypt. Remember, God told him, he says, go to Pharaoh and say, the Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. So they made it to their place of sacrifice where they were going to meet the Lord. God was in the process of fulfilling the prophecy he had given to Abraham all those years ago. Here at the mountain, God offers Israel a new covenant relationship where his presence would now dwell with them, and if they would keep his commands. So this is the same place that God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. He also gives Moses the download on what the Levitical priesthood should look like, the way they set up the tabernacle, the way that God is going to dwell inside of the Ark of the Covenant. All of those blueprints come from Moses going up here and spending time with the Lord and him bringing it down to the children of Israel. So they spent a significant amount of time here at the holy mountain of God, and I put on here, uh, God had to separate them from Egypt to encounter them this way. And I put this question of going, was it because of Egypt or because of them? And what I mean by that is how many things in our life, and I know um, you've heard it said this way before, but what is it like in Egypt in your life that God maybe needs to remove you from so that he can actually come down and dwell with you? You know, what's the Egypt in your life that, and, and I... I really want to end on this part, and I know it's weird, but I want to warn you all, I'm also weird. So I say things that are weird. So I want to end with this thought. Now, if you all give me like, like three or four minutes, I want to end with this. And this is like something unusual that I pull from this story. Uh, it's the darkness, and, and I want to explain that. It, Moses in Exodus 20, 18. So this is a couple, couple of scriptures past what we just ended. It says, now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and they stood far off. And then they said to Moses, you speak to us and we'll hear, but let not God speak to us lest we die. And this is the next verse I, I want to talk about. It says, Moses said to the people, do not fear, 
For God has come to test you that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. So the people stood far off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. And I want to talk about this because it's, it's strange. You know, you would never imagine God being a thick darkness that Moses has to walk into. And, I, and it triggered me in my head because there's other references to this in Scripture. So I went and I looked them up because I've actually taught on these before and they didn't make sense to me then. And I'm, I, So anyway, this is Solomon in Second Chronicles. It's Solomon is speaking uh, a blessing over the temple that he just built and opened. And he says, the Lord said he would dwell in the dark cloud. I have surely built you an exalted house and a place for you to dwell in forever. Well, what Solomon was referencing when he said that was the words of his father, David. So roll the clock back a couple of years and it's David and Psalm going, the Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of isles be glad. Clouds and darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. A fire goes before him and burns up his enemies round about. So it's interesting, I just keep chasing this back. Now now we're back to Abraham. Let's roll the clock a little further back. Abraham tells him in Genesis 15, he says, Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and behold, a horrors and great darkness fell upon him. Then he says to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that's not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them for 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterwards, they will come out with great possessions. So he actually predicts the Exodus all those years ago via Abraham. But it's odd to me that he visits him through horror and great darkness. Anyway, now let's go forward in time to Jesus dying on the cross. It says, Now in the sixth hour had come, there was a darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. So for three hours, Jesus, while Jesus was making an atonement for sin, the whole land was dark with the darkness they had never seen. And that's when Jesus, you guys know this piece, he cries out, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Because he's taking on the burdens and atonement for sin. So <clears throat> there is a mystery to God that can be both frightening and comforting. And I, I, I'm gonna, it's written this way, so I'm going to read it this way. But it's, it is a beautiful truth to know that Jesus has come to give us light, that we might know God. But I believe it is also comforting to know that God is not absent in our darkness, but perhaps closer than we might realize. Darkness can be scary, but let me submit to you that not being afraid of the darkness where God is can lead to some of the most precious encounters and revelations of God that our hearts long for. In fact, let me take it a step further. I believe the majority of us in Western world worship, it Worship the God of comfort, security, and control. This is unpredictable God that cannot be controlled and dwells in deep darkness. Like the Israelites, the majority of us are, are afraid to enter the thick darkness for this reason. But this is where God is. How much might we be missing out on because of our fear? And just like the children, the Israelites, were afraid to walk into what seemed to be scary. This is what this, is what this means to me. Uh, in my life, the, the time I had an encounter with God that what I feel like there was a before and an after, it split my life. Okay, there was a before this moment and an after. I would argue was the darkest time in my entire life. The darkest cloud of pain that I was going through that in, in, in the history of my life. And it was in that moment where I met God. Okay, and I had an encounter with God where he came in and showed me uh, his overwhelming love and s- support for me and the way he viewed me as his son, and I, I found the Lord in the darkness, is, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And the reason Moses was willing to walk into the darkness head first is because the Lord was on the other side, and he knew that. You see what I'm saying? So that's an encouragement for you guys as I close tonight to say, sometimes you need to push into the darkness and know that the Lord is there with you and that he is there to heal you from that darkness. You see what I'm saying? And know that his light is on the other side of that dark cloud sometimes, and he's going to be right there with you. And if you will call out to him, he can heal you from whatever thing that you're going through, because healing is important. Amen? Okay, so next week, um, I am actually going to be out of town. We're going to talk about Joshua. And so just as a little bit of a lead up, and I do plan on making a video to explain this a little bit more, but... Um, I'm going to have someone come and substitute my class for me and 
his name is actually Joshua. So Joshua, um, he's actually sitting right here on the front row. This is Josh. So I would love for you guys to come back next week and support him. Let me give you a little bit of backstory on this. I really feel like God was telling me <clears throat> to uh, get someone to cover my class. I entertained in my head, like recording it myself and just playing it for you guys. But I really feel like God was like, no, get Josh to do it. So I was like, hey, man, I know uh, this doesn't make any sense, but I think you're a good teacher, and I think God's trying to pull your teaching gift out of you and wants you to do this. So I know this is kind of uh, random and off to the side, but would you be willing to do that? And he said yes. So he's been studying and preparing. I actually told him it would be best. I would like to hear his take on it. And I want to encourage you guys to put yourselves in the same shoes. If I were to ask any one of you guys to come up here and teach, um, would you be willing to go and read the story of Joshua? And would you be willing to write your take on it? I think sometimes we get overwhelmed in church thinking you got to be this pastor telling everybody what to do. And a lot of times Christianity should look more like us sharing with each other what God has done in our lives and what he's told us through the scripture. Does that make sense? So we should all be willing to like read these stories and then turn around with each other and share like, look, this is what God showed me through this story right here. And this is where I related and that should bring a little bit of weight off of you to feel like you too could be a teacher. And I, that's kind of how I started tonight. So I'm going to end with that. But the whole reason we do this is to try to equip you guys because there may come a day where you're speaking to a family member or someone at your work. And I think the more uh, prepared you are, the uh, easier it'll be for the Lord to use you. Amen. God meets us at that place of preparation like that. So let me pray and we'll dismiss tonight. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to God to come into your house like this, Father, and study and get to know you better, God. Just like the children of Israel, Father, we want you to be able to come and dwell with us, God. So thank you for sending your son to be the final sacrifice on our door, God, so that we can dwell with you now. When you unleashed your Holy Spirit on the earth, Father, that was forever a finished work. And so now, God, we're, we're grateful that we can walk every day, God, uh, with your Holy Spirit step by step, situation by situation, Father. So we're grateful for that, God. Help keep us in a position of, of gratitude um, and humility underneath your leadership, uh, just like you called your children to, Father. Um, we're, we're grateful. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you for staying later. <laughs>